Our evaluation on the effects of the G20 financial reforms on securitization is the fifth evaluation we're carrying out. The evaluation is more focused than some of the previous ones in that it covers only a subset of the relevant reforms and the market segments. In particular, it focuses on the IOSCO risk retention recommendations and on the Basel Committee revisions to prudential requirements for bank securitization related exposures. These reforms aim to address vulnerabilities in securitization markets that contributed to the amplification of the losses during the global financial crisis. From a market segment perspective, this evaluation focuses on the non-government guaranteed part of the RMBS market and on the CLO market. <clears throat> we published a consultation report with preliminary findings in early July, and the objective of this workshop is to exchange views with industry representatives, academics, and other stakeholders on the findings of that report. Reflecting the market segments covered by the evaluation, our workshop today is divided into two sessions, one on the RMBS market and the other on the CLO market. I will very, very shortly hand it over to Benjamin Weigert, who's the Director General for Financial Stability at the Deutsche Bundesbank. And more importantly to us, he's the chair of the FSB Securitization Evaluation Group. But before I do that, uh, uh, he will speak about the interim findings in the consultation report. But I wanted to stress before I do that, that our objective today is to hear from all of you who have uh, agreed and come online to, to join us. To that end, each session will start with short presentations by a few speakers to try to motivate that discussion before we open the floor to Q&A. And I just invite you to be as open and forthcoming uh, as possible. The final report that we release will consider the feedback that we receive here today, as well as the written responses that we get to the consultation. So I also strongly encourage you to participate through the written procedure in addition to actively participating today. Uh, the deadline for the responses, uh, written responses is September 2nd. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna hand it over to Benjamin. Thank you, thank you, John, for your uh, a warm welcome and uh, and 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 uh, for opening uh, the workshop. Before uh, presenting to you uh, the key findings of the interim report, um, uh, let me highlight a few points. Um, as uh, John already mentioned, uh, uh, FSB ev evaluations focus on reforms that have already been implemented. So, for example, uh, the case uh, in the case of Basel Three. Uh, we examine the effects of the securitization framework already adopted, not the final package of reforms still to be implemented. The evaluation seeks to assess the effectiveness of reforms in terms of financial stability and broader effects on the financial system and, and the economy, both positive and negative. The report does not contain policy recommendations, but rather findings for cons considerations by relevant bodies. The evaluation faces a number of data and methodological uh, challenges. In particular, it has been challenging uh, to us to directly attribute particular market outcomes to the reforms due to, 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 to the various co confounding factors such as the low interest rate environment and many other reforms taking place at the same time. Some caution is therefore needed when interpreting uh, our findings. However, the broad range of information uh, sources and the analytical approaches we use gives us some comfort um, about the conclusions in the report. The analysis concentrates mostly on FSB member jurisdictions with uh, securitization markets that are material from a global perspective and that uh, uh, also have adopted the relevant reforms. In practice, this has uh, meant looking particularly at the ex experiences of the EU, UK and the US uh, securitization markets. While our findings uh, are preliminary, they indicate uh, uh, that reforms have contributed to the resilience of the securitization market without strong evidence of material negative side effects on financing to the economy. Next slide, please. As you can see, a range of reforms were introduced in the aftermath of the global financial uh, crisis to address uh, the weaknesses identified in the securitization market and its participants. Out of the numerous reforms, we focus 
on the IOSCO risk retention recommendations published in 2012 and the BCBS prudential requirements, in particular the revised securitization framework, which was published in 2014 and due in 2018. Conceptually, uh, both sets of reforms aim to reduce misaligned incentives and moral hazard by promoting skin in the game for securitization issuers. In addition, prudential reforms increase the skin in the game for bank investors in securitizations, thereby enhancing the incentives to assess the default risk of the underlying exposure. Consequently, uh, reforms that reduce misaligned incentives are expected to create securitization structures that are of higher qu credit quality. By changing the availability, cost, or perceived risk of risk securitization for market participants, reforms should internalize system, uh, systemic risk externalities while also supporting the development of sustainable and resilient securitization markets. The majority of FSB member jurisdictions have implemented the BCBS and IOSCO securitization reforms. You can see this uh, uh, indicated by the yellow, uh, yellow boxes in the panel. FSB member jurisdictions report overall adherence to the scope and definitions under the BCBS revised securitization framework, but there is some dispersion in the implementation of certain requirements, such as on the adoption of simple, transparent, and compar comparable uh, criteria and around synthetic risk transfer. Concerning the risk uh, retention regulation, uh, minimum levels of risk retention and permitted forms are similar across FSB jurisdictions with the differences in implementation related to securitization of asset classes that are exempt from the, uh, from the requirements. A good example of this uh, is the US open market CLO market uh, following the overturn of the risk retention rule by a US court in 2018. Let me now turn uh, to uh, the main market trends. Global outstanding non-agency securitization volumes experienced a spike around the GFC period. RMBS represents the largest uh, segment around the third of cash securitization globally and is much more significant for some jurisdictions, though most of it's government guaranteed and hence, uh, though most of it is uh, government uh, guaranteed and outside the scope of this uh, evaluation. The CLO market has been a fast growing segment uh, mainly in the US, but also in Europe, while CDOs have largely disappeared since, uh, since the crisis. The securitization market is largest in absolute terms in the US and the EU. Other FSB member jurisdictions in which securitization markets uh, uh, are sizable are uh, Australia, Canada, China, Japan, and to some extent, Brazil and South uh, Korea. The aggregate picture marks quite some uh, uh, marks uh, uh, marks uh, quite some heterogeneity for example outstanding cash securitizations in the us uh, in the eu peaked at around the time of the eurozone sovereign debt crisis uh, 2010 2011 and have declined since then in some markets while securitization volumes have declined since then there has been a slight pickup in recent years in some cases reaching higher levels than during pre gfc times Next slide. Looking at, uh, at the non-government guaranteed uh, uh, RMBS market, we can see that uh, the, the European and the US market are characterized by fewer defaults of rated tranches following the GFC. The, sh the chart shows post-2010 issuances contribute minimally to tranche defaults, which indicates an improvement in asset quality. This is, uh, this is also driven uh, by, uh, by, by other factors, favorable macroeconomic conditions during that time, uh, improvements in underwriting standards with stricter rules since the GFC, changes in the methodolo methodology of credit rating agencies aimed at generating more rating stability, applying a stricter stance in the rating uh, process. Next slide. Uh, Looking at the CLO market in more detail, uh, we can see in the first panel uh, that uh, CLOs post GFC, um, uh, also known as CLO 2.0, have higher levels of credit enhancement to protect senior tranche holders from losses. Uh, 
There are also other enhancements, such as uh, limits in how much a CLO manager can invest in triple C uh, rated loans alongside other tests, triggers, and covenants embedded in the structures. Despite the, uh, the more uh, uh, robust structures, uh, the quality of the underlying leverage loans has continued to deteriorate. The middle chart shows how, how the leverage of corporates, as measured by the debt to EBITDA uh, ratio, has grown since 2010, while the right hand chart shows a number of indicators reflecting weaker underwriting standards since the GFC. Next slide. The prudential reforms may have contributed to a shift in bank CLO exposures uh, from mezzanine to senior tranches. Banks uh, CLO holdings are concentrated in a small number of large US and Japanese banks with a significant cross-border dimension. Banks hold mainly AAA rated CLO tranches for various reasons, including yield pickup, liquidity management and relationship management. The more risk sensitive regulatory, uh, regulatory capital charges under basis three, as well as other post GFC reforms may have contributed to this outcome. Lower in the CLO capital structure, the main, the main buyers of the mezzanine tranches are money managers and in the case of, uh, uh, of the US insurers. The equity tranche nowadays is mostly held by asset managers and hedge, hedge funds. So it's moved uh, to the, NB, um, to the, to the uh, NBFI uh, sector. When it comes to risk retention in CLO markets, uh, uh, the practice that third party investors, finance CLO managers retained risk uh, raises some questions about the extent to which the objective of risk alignment is fulfilled. Since several CLO managers tend to operate with light balance sheets, any retained risk would force them to fund these, risk, uh, these assets with additional debt or equity. This has contributed to the establishment of risk retention vehicles to attract third party investors such as pension funds or family offices. These appear to be widely used uh, uh, in, in both the US and Europe. We welcome your views on whether this practice is aligned with the goals of uh, risk retention regulation, particularly in cases where the risk is moved to parties that do not belong to the same corporate group as a CLO manager. In addition, uh, other factors besides risk retention requirements, such, such as compensation structures and reputational concerns, are considered by CLO investors to achieve risk alignment. Let me now turn to the broader effects and in particular the impact of the reforms on the financing of the economy. Securitization has diminished in relation to private, uh, to private, uh, 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 private sector credit since the GFC, as shown by the left-hand chart. However, this does not necessarily imply that overall financing to the economy has been negatively affected. First, we should not use the pre-GFC period as a benchmark, as it was characterized by excessively risky lending. Second, much of the reduction in securitization took place uh, before the reforms were agreed and adopted. Third, securitization actually grew since the reforms uh, in, in some market seg segments, such as CLOs. And finally, there is limited other evidence uh, to suggest that overall financing has suffered because of the reforms. Another reason uh, why, uh, uh, why securitization has diminished in relation to private sector credits since the G GFC is that the use of alternative financing instruments has increased. In particular, uh, financial institutions turned to government guaranteed RMBS in the US and in Japan and covered bonds in Europe to finance residential mortgage lending. Covered bond bonds also emerged as a suitable funding option in the euro area to pledge as collateral for short-term uh, central bank refinancing. In jurisdictions where banks use securitization for uh, risk transfer and capital relief, they have also adopted for syn synthetic securitization. In addition, debt issuance by non-financial corporates has grown significantly in recent years as an alternative uh, to bank uh, borrowing. Banks have moved their securitization exposure towards lower risk tranches especially after the implementation of the Basel Securitization Framework in 2018. 
The left-hand chart shows how risk weight density has trended down as banks shifted to mostly senior tranches to lower their regulatory capital and to some extent satisfy liquidity needs. The right-hand chart indicates the bank's overall exposure have continued to grow in line with the wider credit exposure since the GFC. Most importantly, also from a financial system perspective is whether uh, we've seen a redistribution of risk across the financial system. And uh, what this, uh, the, the chart uh, shows uh, quite, quite clearly is that we see um, uh, a redistribution towards non-banks. In Australia, uh, Europe, and the US, there has been a shift from the banking to the non-banking financial uh, institutions uh, since 2011, with the latter increasing its share of securitization issuances significantly. The shift to the non-bank uh, sector is not unique to securitization, as various conjunctural factors and structural changes in the global financial system since the GFC have increased reliance on market-based intermediation. It's worth noting that banks in, in most cases continue to have a liquidity provision role and to support securitization issuances by non-banks as, for example, broker dealers and warehouse lenders. Let me conclude by repeating what, uh, what John said, uh, uh, the deadline, uh, uh, and it's really a deadline for consultation responses, is the, uh, the, uh, September 2nd. Um, we will uh, 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 conduct uh, additional uh, uh, analysis uh, in the second phase of the uh, evaluation. Um, and uh, we would uh, uh, welcome any feedback from your side uh, that would inform uh, additional in analysis um, uh, in, for, for the um, uh, evaluation team. Um, the publication of the final uh, report is expected uh, by the end of 2024. I would turn to the second, uh, to the to the to the uh, to the first um, to the first uh, panel um, of uh, our uh, of our workshop. Um, we will uh, focus in the first session on the uh, non-agency RMBS market. Um, I'm very happy uh, to have an excellent panel to get us started. Thanks also for the team uh, uh, organizing. Uh, uh, identifying and organizing uh, uh, the, the, the panel. Um, I will introduce each speaker in turn and ask uh, uh, them to provide initial uh, remarks, uh, uh, maximum three minutes, uh, and please stick to the time as our time is, 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 is limited. Uh, we will have a second round uh, with the panel and then open up for Q&A to the audience. Um, the first I want to introduce on the panel is Salim Natu. Uh, he's a partner at Allen Over and Allen and Over Shearman with over 25 uh, years of experience in structured finance and securitization. His work involves a wide variety of asset classes uh, with a mortgage space across the UK, uh, Ireland, uh, the Scandinavian market, the Middle East, um, though he has also worked uh, on transactions in the US, uh, Australia, Korea, Singapore, and Japan. Salim, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I was going to start my session with just a, a welcome to this consultation. I think it's a it's a it's a good thing to do to take stock of how the reforms following the GFC have been implemented over time and how they're being received in the market. And I think that was very helpful for that oversight that we've just had. Um, I was going to start with a few observations in, in my short three minutes. The, the first was that um, if the purpose of or one of the benefits of securitization is to diversify funding away from banks and allowing recycling of capital and, and to move risk around the system, then, then one of the things that uh, we look at is is, is there really a market at the moment in with with what's happened with the post financial crisis with the central banks providing significant funding and with guaranteed you know agencies in the US and that's one of the whether there's an impediment in the way the reforms have been implemented 
post GFC that that stopped non bank players coming in or banks actually funding themselves and diversifying that credit risk away uh, when in their mortgage lending platforms. And when we look at the reforms, that there's a few observations I'd make. The first is that it's very inconsistently applied. Even even the definition of securitization used within different geographies in in the member states is is very different. So that and it has very real outcomes. So for example, bank lending structures in some parts of the world are not securitizations, whereas the same bank lending structures against mortgage assets in in a European context, for example, would potentially be securitizations with retention requirements. And that inconsistency plays out across a number of different areas and the inconsistency in the way the reforms are implemented means that you end up with def very different markets emerging in different parts of the world, not always in a good way. Um, and it, it, another example is just simply that investors, for example, in Europe could not invest in mortgage, mortgage assets in other jurisdictions very easily um, because of the differences in the way the rules are implemented between different geographies. Another observation that I think I'd like to make is that um, in, in the mortgage market, there's a lot of innovation and that innovation seems to be reserved because of the way the capital uh, constraints are for banks reserved to non-bank financial institutions and or smaller banks that are emerging and providing challenges to the existing banking structure. And, and that innovation that's occurring right now is something that's being encouraged by governments um, because it, it addresses political concerns about the cost of borrowing for borrowers, for socially impacted borrowers, for different types of mortgage products. And the, the way the reforms have been implemented, potentially including on retention or the definitions, it doesn't always fit very well with some of the new models of lending that have arisen over time. And so we, we quite often come across structures where you will have private equity players, platform lenders and senior le bank lenders looking to try and create products and working out how are they going to achieve retention within those sorts of players and those more dynamic structures than what, what we've traditionally seen in the mortgage funding space. And so that, that I think sort of begs a question around, are, are we with the reforms putting blocks on innovation going forward? The, the, the last point I, before I sort of turn over is the, the question around, we, we talk about high quality credit assets, but over the time period that we've been talking about since the GFC, that there's a real imperative to try and finance segments of the mortgage market, which are very difficult to finance. So subprime um, is reflecting borrowers that have bad credit history or non-performing loan securitizations have been a real driver in, in large parts of Europe. Uh, and governments have encouraged banks to shed their non-performing loan portfolios. Um, or high LTV mortgages where governments are providing guarantees of the first losses on portfolios are, are all securitizations where you have perhaps poor quality assets, but securitization has a, a role to play in diversifying the risk and finding investors and finding ways of lending into the real economy against those sorts of products. And then I think the reforms that have been implemented sometimes do get in the way of being able to properly access those markets and those uh, allow that sort of innovation or that type of funding that governments want to actually achieve. So that, that I was going to stop with those observations at this point. Thank you, Salim. And uh, I would now turn to um, uh, uh, to to uh, Janet, uh, Janet Orem. Um, Janet joined uh, uh, the university's uh, superannuation scheme in 2021 as a head of uh, ABS. Previously, she worked at uh, BlackRock for 15 years um, uh, as, as, uh, as head of uh, uh, European ABS, and prior to that as a, at a rating agency and a UK non-bank consumer lender. 
Janet is speaking in the capacity of a long-term market participant. Um, Janet, uh, the, the floor is yours. Um, so I was just going to start by echoing Salim's comment that you know, the, the, the review of the regulation and their impact is very welcome. Very well. Um, so reform was obviously a necessary response to the 2008 financial crisis. Is there a terrible echo? You do. I don't know why there's an echo. Okay, I will carry on. Um, but I think when we're we're thinking about the impact that securitization had, it's actually really important to bear in mind that yes, securitization did enable the distribution of risk in the form of US subprime mortgages, but actually the root cause of the problem was the terrible underwriting practices, which were not mirrored in Europe and the UK. Um, and I am going to go and talk quite a bit about lending practices, um, but my experience is largely EU and UK markets, so that's what I'm going to focus on. So if we look at the non-agency RMBS market now, it clearly has better quality underlying loans, it's got better performance in terms of arrears and credit performance and, and downgrades. But actually, I believe this has more to do with changes in the consumer law that have happened, changes to prudential regulation of lending practices. And we have some slightly different mortgage products now in the transactions, which are largely a function of those things. And we've had a long period of low and stable interest rates. And I think actually that is more what's contributed to the current stability of the non-agency RMBS than necessarily being a direct consequence of the regulatory interventions. Um, and as noted in the report, there have been many overlapping sets of regulations. And so I do think it is very easy to say there is obvious correlation between the reform implementation and the market being more resilient, but I'm not sure we can actually identify direct evidence of causation of the individual elements. Moving on to the two elements that we were looking to discuss today, so risk retention. In principle, risk retention, I, I, it's a fundamentally, it's a good thing. We generally had it in one form or another and in varying sizes in European and UK transactions pre-GFC. It is, to, to some of Salim's points, it, it's quite a blunt tool in terms of trying to align risk and address conflicts of interest. We could probably recalibrate it, but as a principle, I do think it provides a backstop to backstop to prevent excesses and inappropriate behavior during market cycles. Just looking at some of the analysis of perhaps seeking to establish a relationship between retention and performance or retention structures and pricing, I, I think it's very easy to draw conclusions that perhaps don't reflect the reason why a retention structure is chosen or the types of transactions that select certain retention structures. And when I look at how to price the deal, I will obviously check that risk retention is in place, but our analysis of potential misaligned incentives is based on many, many more factors than at risk retention. We look at the nuances of the structure and all the different bits and pieces that, that go with the risk we're taking on. Moving on to STS, I have to say I don't see an obvious material impact in terms of the assets or the structure or the volumes of deals that are labeled as STS. If I look at an STS deal, I believe that it would have happened in very much very similar form without the STS label. Um, main impact is obviously the capital treatment for the banks, and that does drive demand for some of the transactions which possibly wouldn't have been there in the same way without the label, and it does have an impact on pricing but it's hard to quantify the impact on pricing because most of the transactions currently labeled as STS were the types of transactions that priced more tightly than the broader market before the introduction of the STS label. I think we focused a lot on a resilient and stable market, which clearly everyone wants, but picking up on another point Salim made, we need the securitization market to recycle bank capital and to provide funding so the banks can go off and do the lending we need them to do to fund our economies, finance the energy transition. And so we need to just also be looking forward to say, do we have the regulation that directly supports that in a sustainable way? And just one last point I would make, um, unintended consequences. I think the G20 level is possibly not where most of the unintended consequences sit. I think Anselin made a number of points about how the, the, the regulations have been implemented differently across jurisdictions. There is a transaction, a European transaction in the market today and I've looked at it, and I have no tolerance for um, taking regulatory risk in our portfolio. 
and because I now have different le uh, different rules in the EU and the UK, and I'm a UK regulated institution, I won't be looking at that transaction. That's just not helpful for the market. And I shall end there. I've probably gone over by three minutes, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, <coughs> Janet. And uh, um, I would now turn to uh, Alexander uh, Bachvarov, uh, who is head of International Structured Finance Research and Strategy at uh, at the Bank of America. Um, uh, he 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 has uh, worked previously at Citibank and uh, Moody's Investor Service, as well as in academia. He is currently based in London, with pri with a primary focus on the structured finance market in in Europe, Australia, and Japan. Alexander, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Benjamin. I uh, appreciate the ability, to, uh, the possibility to share our views. We welcome the report. Uh, and we do think that uh, there's a little bit more work to be done and some additional aspects to be evaluated. I echo the comments of my colleagues, uh, and I will try in my commentary not to repeat um, um, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> Um, with which I agree. Um, looking back pre and post GFC with regards to the RMBS market, uh, for me, the key difference is that uh, the markets are very different in size, uh, particularly in the jurisdictions uh, I focus on, uh, UK, EU, Australia, and Japan. Um, we saw shift away from uh, the public uh, private label market into agencies in Japan, as was indicated before. And we saw a significant shift away from the RMBS market into the covered bond market uh, in the Eurozone. Um, that same change did not occur in Australia and the UK, predominantly because we believe of the asset encumbrance limits which are enforced in those jurisdictions um, publicly or, or, or less so. Um, the reforms in terms of risk retention and um, uh, Basel uh, prudential requirements uh, had some effect. Um, I do believe in the need for regulation but I also believe in the need of uh, equivalent, uniform, proportionate regulation, which I would not say is the case uh, with regards to um, how Basel prudential requirements were implemented uh, and how risk retention was implemented. Um, if I have to kind of generalize uh, a bit, Prior to GFC, we had risk retention in Europe uh, and in Australia and Japan uh, that was not um, mandatory, but it was practiced. Post GFC, we have mandatory global risk retention, but the way it's implemented and practiced uh, diverges across jurisdictions. As a result, we lead to uh, a massive market fragmentation. And I echo what uh, uh, Janet just mentioned. Um, and also Salim, uh, European investors cannot uh, participate in large parts of the global securitization market. And I can actually say that probably global securitization market does not exist um, for that reason. And uh, there is no fluidity and continuity and liquidity across the different market segments. There is generally a view that risk retention is the only way or the key reason to implement uh, and apply skin in the game and uh, a realignment of interest. I tend to disagree with that. Um, there are other ways, um, prudential requirements for underwriting, um, the uh, transparency and disclosure requirements. And in fact, uh, what we are seeing globally is that differences in how these particular uh, variations of prudential requirements are implemented lead to further fragmentation of the market. Um, so some investors may be perfectly happy with uh, the risk retention of some U.S. deals, uh, but they cannot buy them because they don't have the transparency and disclosure and, and vice versa. Uh, so, broadly speaking, the risk retention uh, regulation effects cannot be isolated, and I would not be really rushing to conclusion that uh, 
um, they had a positive effect on the market or they did not distort the financing of the market. The bank behavior also changed. Um, uh, Janet referred to STS. I fully agree with her that they did not change really the volume or the composition of the asset classes. However, it changed the motivation of banks to buy uh, one product to another. So the differences in uh, STS, uh, which is really only in UK and, and the Eurozone uh, as, as a part of the market, uh, the inability to apply some form of uh, general acceptance of STC versus STS uh, globally, uh, the differences in liquidity treatment, LCI eligibility, uh, repo requirements and repo eligibility and so on, uh, further fragment the market and what the banks uh, in different jurisdictions can or cannot buy and can or cannot participate in the securitization market. Um, has the securitization continued to distribute risk? I'm um, moderately skeptic skeptical about the view that we have shifted away from the banks and into non-bank sector uh, for securitization. Actually, the fact is that many non-bank financial institutions sought registration as banks um, and um, continue to uh, to and, and are registered as banks, uh, particularly in the in the European auto sector, auto lending sector. Uh, the growth in the non-bank financial institutions to a large degree was driven on the pressure on banks in the case of Australia and on the pressure on bank lending requirements in the case of the UK. And that has been very limited, uh, found limited expression in Europe, only in the context of UK, uh, sorry, Dutch buy to let uh, mortgage market. So uh, the shift away from the banks to non-banks for me is not uh, a permanent or it's not uh, a final uh, development. The shift from banks to agency and covered bonds is permanent uh, and, and, uh, and constant. That leads for me uh, to the conclusion that we may not have actually redistributed risk away from the banking system we may have concentrated it in terms of mortgage lending in the banking system in the Eurozone or in the sovereign level in countries like Japan and the US. Um, and I'll stop here and uh, um, reserve the ability to comment further uh, in the second round. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, and um, I just want to encourage uh, the, the audience uh, also to use the chat, uh, 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 providing comments or uh, uh, raising questions. We are monitoring uh, the chat uh, as to, to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, collect all the uh, questions and then uh, bring them up here. Um, finally, let me invite uh, Amiyatosh Ponanandam. Uh, uh, sorry, I uh, apologize for, uh, for any mispronunciation. Um, uh, he will cover uh, the, the topic from an um, uh, academic perspective. Ami Yatosh is, is a Michael Stark Professor of Finance at the Ross uh, School of Business at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, he has published extensively on topics related to banking, securitization, and risk management policies. He has also served on the editorial boards of several leading journals in finance and currently serves as a director of the Financial Intermediation Research Society. Over to you, Ami Yatosh. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for inviting me to share my views on this important topic. So broadly, uh, I'm really happy with the, the progress we have seen so far since the GFC. Uh, with all these uh, regulations. Now, though it's true that we cannot uh, always directly uh, uh, assign causation to uh, risk retention rules or the capital requirements to certain outcomes, broadly, uh, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that post-GFC reforms, regulatory reforms, have really improved the financial stability uh, across, uh, across the globe. And uh, markets failed uh, during the GFC, and therefore we needed regulation, and so far we have made good progress. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there, there is always that risk, uh, there is always that possibility that something is still go wrong, uh, 
And I have uh, three points that I'd like to share uh, 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 on that broad theme in the three minutes that I have. So my first point is the way is the risk sitting right now. Even from the report's perspective, it will be great if we can get some more handle on the non-bank FIs, uh, the shadow banks or NBFIs. Um, we really do not know a whole lot. I mean, we'd love to know a little bit more about who are these, uh, 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 these, these institutions. How are they connected explicitly or implicitly with the sector that we care more, more about in terms of bailout? Uh, or, uh, through counterparty risk, through ownership structure, that is, if we can get more data, more disclosure, more information on the underlying economic interest, where does it lie? And is it connected to the banking sector? Because that's, at the end of the day, is a key thing, whether we think about uh, uh, explicit or implicit bailout or, uh, or government guarantee, we need a better handle on NBFIs and who they are. The second point, uh, which relates to the first one, is that Look, we should not lose sight of the fact that despite all the reforms, we always run a small chance of a systemic failure. And some of my earlier speakers, our earlier speakers have talked about low interest rate environment, the fact that perhaps we, we saw very little default because interest rates were favorable. Uh, that might change. Uh, that is changing. There's always this notion of the, the, the concern about some hidden risk, some operational risk. Where I'm going with that, that I saw also in the report and also in the whole lot of focus that we have on these regulations, have this flavor of ex ante making things great. That let's improve the, the, the screening, let's improve the underwriting standards, and that's really good. But should failure were to happen, even with a very, very small probability, what do we do? I was hoping to see a little bit more discussion on that. And to be precise, and it relates to the point about the NBFI is that, that depending on where the risk is sitting, sitting, depending on the funding structure of those NBFIs, the way we will think about fire sale externality, should something go wrong, is going to be different. The way we will think about the, 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 the idea of how are we going to resolve a crisis should it come upon us is going to be very different. So one of the, 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 the thing I strongly recommend uh, for both our report and, and, and regulation going forward is to think a little bit about a plan uh, uh, if things go, 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 go wrong. And the plan will start, uh, I think, with better disclosure requirements on tracing the economic interest as these securities, different tranches, move through the chain of securitization. Uh, we have made improvement, no doubt, since the GFC, but we are still, if I want to figure out what is the underlying economic interest, including ownership, counterparty risk, guarantees put together for different institutions, and the report talk, talks about the data limitation. So I'm, 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 I'm hoping that we'll, 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 we'll improve, uh, uh, get a little bit better on that, that, that dimension. And, and my third point relates to the issue of uh, what I call the industrial organization of, uh, of, of, of this market. Uh, the, the, as in the European market, the, the mortgage exposure is sitting now, this, these RMBAs, uh, the issuance, with a very few set of banks. So again, uh, there are two issues here. One is that, well, are we changing the competitive landscape a little bit that, that is making some of the smaller players less competitive because of these regulations? And second, uh, uh, how do we think about the concentration risk? Again, if something were to go wrong, we have to, to, to worry about it. And finally, to stay within my time limit, I'll just say one thing, that we have seen numerous banking failure, numerous financial crises around the world, and every time the crisis begins for some different reasons. Sometimes it's mortgage credit risk, sometimes it's interest rate risk, sometimes it's, uh, it's issues uh, in, in a hidden corner of the market. But if I had to pick one thing that has remained constant throughout the episodes of financial and banking crisis is that somebody stood to gain a lot by taking excessive risk. Under that team, having more skin in the game seems like the most sensible strategy because we cannot just go after the sources of risk. Incentives have to be aligned. So broadly, my concluding remark is that thinking along the lines of capital requirement, better incentive alignment is the right 
approach in terms of the way we want to think about our regulation. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Ami Yatosh. And uh, uh, this closes the first round uh, of, uh, uh, of comments, of um, uh, interventions. And in the interest of time, uh, I, I would hand it back to the, uh, uh, to the panelists uh, to immediately react to points raised by, uh, uh, by, by the fellow panelists. Um, and, uh, if, uh, uh, and after that, would uh, uh, open uh, the session to uh, Q&A from the audience. Do you want to react to each each other? Can I maybe pick up on uh, an observation on Ami Atosh's analysis there, particularly around diversification of risk and, and looking at significant risk transfer and that, that sort of becoming more important for banks and the way in which they're moving risk from the bank sector to the non-bank sector. I think non-neutrality on the capital holdings of securization positions, um, what was a deliberate policy, um, is an impediment to that the diversification potentially. At least that's what we hear from a lot of banks. Uh, and so it's an area where I think if, if we are looking at where risk is in, in the market and where it moves to, um, whether non-neutrality achieves its objectives. And I know there is adjustments and calibrations and discussions about what that right level should be, but, but just picking up on that, I just wanted to note that, you know, as risk transfer becomes more important, I think, for banks, uh, as part of a work out of a bank and what how they manage their capital and avoid those cliff risks, essentially, um, being able to, to take that risk out of the system it is an important part of the thinking around what the what the capital alignments are going to be and what the what the capital requirements are for for holdings in securization. Uh, Janet. Yes, also picking up something that Amiatosh just mentioned around concentration risk. I think he makes some very good points about being able to track. Um, risk through the system and, and more data would be great. I would say that that probably doesn't just apply to securitization though. And the last thing I would want to encourage is further burden on the securitization market that isn't uh, applicable to, to other similar asset classes where there is risk spreading through the system simply because as he uh, identified the, the causes of the crisis are different each time. But just coming back to the concentration risk, I think it's, it's, it's a, a very good point, but it also is, is reflective on the, the asset manager side, actually. Due to the level of regulatory burden uh, required in UK, Europe, elsewhere, to invest in a securitization, we actually have quite a concentration of investors in as much as we have some very large asset managers. And rather than do direct securitization, people, corporates, whoever, who potentially could run their own portfolios are using the large asset managers. So you end up with concentrations of views, ideas, and, and, and assets being held on behalf of other people, but within a BlackRock, uh, an Insight, an M&G, uh, that there are not a broad selection of investors in the market, and this is partly a consequence of the way that the, the regs have been implemented. Thank you, Janet. And if uh, if there is no other reaction from the panelists, uh, I would hand over to Costas. Yes, uh, thanks very much um, uh, to the panelists also on my end. Um, the issues they've raised are the issues we've struggled with uh, during the evaluation. And obviously, um, the uh, we, we, we're playing with counterfactuals. Um, at the uh, ultimately, and the question is, uh, what would be, how could we actually um, quantify the effects of the reforms? Is is the difficult challenge? Uh, just a quick comment and, a, and a, perhaps a question. The comment is the plea for looking at the prudential framework again and the non capital non neutrality and the like. It's a little bit ironic in the in the sense that. The reforms were actually intended um, to uh, move some of the more risky uh, investments out of the banking sector and into NBFI, which is one of the reasons why we've been looking at this question of uh, 
uh, the changes and also to make the prudential framework more sensitive uh, in light of the lessons from the GFC. So if, if we do believe that um, risk, some of this kind of risk, longer term risk is, is best held by non-bank investors, then why are we, are we pleading for banks to get more into the business again? Um, but the more important question from my end, uh, reference was made to the uh, potential impact of cross-border investments um, in the sense that uh, investors, especially in, in some parts of Europe, are more uh, impacted by requirements, making them more uh, hesitant or unable to invest in other jurisdictions. Is there a way to quantify this effect? Because it obviously has to do with the investments we're not seeing compared to what they could be. Um, how can we go about um, substantiating that there is a material impact, if any? Thank you. If I may address the question. Yeah, Alexander. Um, the way we look at uh, the fragmentation or alternatively the availability of investments to different groups of investors is by estimating, uh, not precisely, but relatively representatively, uh, what percentage of its market meets specific requirements that are set up by another market. In a very simple way, uh, you're going to have a discussion on CLOs in the second part today. What percentage of US CLOs have risk retention which meets the European requirements? Uh, what percentage of the U.S. bribery table mortgages or credit card deals and so on uh, have risk retention comparable to Europe or, or meeting the requirements of the EU? Um, and the answer is that somewhere between 10 and 15 percent perhaps uh, would be accessible on a risk retention requirement basis by EU investors to the U.S. market. The Second question then becomes whether the transparency and disclosure requirements are adequate uh, to meet this uh, European requirement. So if we take the Australian market, uh, we believe that risk retention is 100% uh, available and compliant with EU regulations, but the transparency uh, meeting the EU template requirements uh, is there only for a small subsection of the Australian RMBS market. And now, from November, a UK would not be requiring, requiring the same template. So suddenly, all EU, uh, sorry, all Australian product, um, auto or RMBS, would become available to UK investor, uh, but not necessarily available to EU investor. And that puts the uh, asset managers in a very complex position um, of determining uh, their investor base, the look-through uh, for different instruments and, and what the requirements they meet and whether they are relevant for the respective or acceptable to the ex respective um, investor base. Um, I wanted to add one other point. Um, um, I have some uh, concerns about the estimates of the um, securitization market post GFC, uh, particularly as it comes to Europe, uh, because the market uh, is substantially, RMBS is retained. Um, last year, the place volume of RMBS transactions in the EU was in the single digits, uh, where the retained volume was a multiple of that. From our perspective, this is not really a market. The retained volume is not available to the investor base. And from that perspective, uh, we think we, even if it's counted, it should be uh, marked as retained and not available and not market volume, simply bank funding uh, through repo, whether it's bilateral or ECB. Uh, that's uh, another uh, uh, question that could be uh, addressed. Uh, for the non-bank financial institutions, my last point uh, with regards to monitoring, uh, I do agree that we need to know 
uh, the movements and, and the volumes and the connections to the banking sector. Uh, in that regard, I think Australia is setting some interesting examples where a big portion of the market is shifting from banks to non-banks, particularly in the auto loan sector, which is not subject to discussion today, but also in the mortgage sector. And a lot of that was driven by the Royal Commission developments in the last five, seven years. Um, the reporting and clarity of the bank pools and non-bank pools, um, which uh, the Australian authorities require, is probably one of the ways to uh, evaluate the risks that are developing, not only from the perspective of securitization itself, but also from the systemic point of view of, uh, of the respective market, and something that we may need to address in Europe, not only for ABS, RMBS, but also for comparable secured instruments. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And um, Veronique, uh, raised her hand. Please uh, come in. Can you hear me? Yes, now yes, we hear you. I, I, yeah. I was unable myself to, to, to um, open my microphone. Thank you very much for uh, uh, opening the floor to, to participants. Um, I would just start with uh, echoing what Alex just said about the, um, the, 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 the fact that it would be great in the final report to um, uh, put aside, I would say, in some of the analysis, maybe not all of them, but some uh, in terms of market trends and so on, to isolate the, the, the retained uh, securitization, because clearly uh, they are, um, uh, they are the very specific usage of the securitization instrument, um, not really for uh, risk sharing uh, or, or immediate long-term funding. It's really kind of transforming illiquid asset into more liquid asset, but still in the bank's balance sheet, so um, and with no impact of the prudential regulation, because obviously there will be no SRT uh, qualification. So I think uh, in the interest of, of comparing apple and oranges, uh, uh, although I, I recognize it is quite difficult in the same way as you have uh, excluded the agency securitization, I think it would make sense to exclude also the, um, the retained uh, part of the market and it would provide better order of magnitude, if you like, in the, in the market analysis. Um, what I wanted to, to, to come back on is the, is the fundamental issue, I think, which is, um, are we comfortable with more shift toward the, the NBFI sector? And um, is this a positive or a negative? I think it's 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 fair to say that it was clearly an intended consequence uh, um, of the of the reform to to uh, fight also against the uh, too big to fail and 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 as a result uh, um, reduce the excessive reliance on bank funding as um, and especially especially in Europe where frankly it hasn't really. Uh, changed much, and the CMU is still very much work in progress. So I think we need to we need to recognize this uh, this this trend. Uh, the constraints on banks' balance sheets are such that we cannot expect them to to grow significantly their balance sheet and their risk uh, taking capabilities, and, um, and 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 so it is an expected outcome of the of the overall program of reforms and securitization is only part of that uh, broader picture, as, as other people have said, and I think is very important. Now, I think where securitization is a little bit specific is that it, it does provide access to uh, NBFI, to, to the risk-taking capabilities, but with origination uh, mostly done by banks, and also recognizing that some, uh, some part of the securitization market is also issued by non-banks lenders, direct lenders, I think the choice, uh, the policy choice at the broader level is really between, do we want to give to NBFI direct access to lending, or, do, or are we more comfortable, or, or do we need a balance, because it's not black or white, do we need a balance between direct lending by non-banks and um, risk taking uh, by non-banks of risks that have been originated by banks. And I see some benefit of that second trend where securitization plays the role, SRT securitization in particular, because in that case, the origination of, of, of loans is very tightly supervised, regulated by things in Europe like the loan origination mon monitoring guidelines of the EBA and supervised by, by quite uh, intrusive supervision, which is not the case 
for um, NBFIs, even if they have, of course, some regulation, but in a different mode, if you like, more, more focused on investor protection than on uh, underlying due diligence and so on and so forth. So I think securitization has a role to play, certainly a bigger role to play in Europe, um, but whether we use securitization or we or, or the financial sector move directly towards uh, direct lending by by non banks, the outcome in terms of NBFI will be the same. I.e., the risk will will stay outside of the of the of the banking uh, regulation itself. So, I think we should not. Um, we, sh we should keep uh, this report focusing on securitization, on the securitization part, and not focus too much on NBFI, which obviously is is, is, is a subject which is uh, on the agenda of the FSB for, for quite some time now and, and, and quite actively. So I think securitization is, in a sense, a safe way to transfer risk to the, from the banking sector to the, to the NBFI, safer way than direct lending. Thank you, Veronique, and uh, uh, first for the, uh, uh, for the helpful comment regarding um, uh, uh, retained, um, uh, retained uh, securitizations uh, and how we um, uh, uh, discuss it in the report, and also the thoughtful uh, uh, comment on, on, on where do we want to uh, where, where do we want to um, shift the uh, lending to and where should their origination? Uh, take place. Um, Put another hand raised from Tamara. Tamara. I just wanted to give you some figures to support what Veronique and Alexander has said on, on the retained part. In Europe, for example, we have uh, banks have issued about 100 billion of uh, uh, SRT transactions for capital release or risk mitigation in 2023, and the same amount of uh, true sale were also issued. So it means that this SRT part, which is not analyzed in your report at all, which is not at all, and which is globally as big as the CLO market, because we have, uh, I think globally, uh, in the surveys we are doing at the ICPM, we have about 600 billion of um, retained of uh, SRT inventory by end 2023. It is really a shame that you don't do that. Uh, because if you want <coughs> the securitization to play a role in, uh, in what Veronique said, meaning in helping that it is banks that are originating the loans. There is one condition that uh, Salim has said, the non-neutrality approach of a Basel II must be effective and consistent across the various uh, major jurisdictions. So there is, it is really to analyze the SRT part separately than the, uh, the true sale part, which is mainly an, uh, an investment grade part. The SRT part is driven by the bank's supply if the uh, regulation enables an effective capital release. And the, the senior part of the uh, true sale is driven mostly, as Alexander has said also, by due diligence or disclosure requirement that can be sometimes excessive, sometimes even non, not existing, but needs to exist to protect the, the, the investors, to protect the banks, but, uh, because they need to have investors that are professionals. So this separation between the two types of transaction is not done on your report, and the analysis of the SRT part of the securitization is also not there. Also, it is as big as a CLO. So it is, well, we can help you by, by providing figures, but it's really something that I would recommend that you develop further before the, uh, before the final report is published. Thank you, Tamar. And uh, we have three more um, questions. Goal? Um, Born. Born. I just wanted to say that so I sort of had an initial reaction reading through the report that it was very much focused on sort of confirming at a high level that there was an absence of unintended consequences and sort of major market distortions resulting from the reforms that had come through post GFC, but it, but it wasn't sort of appearing to empirically address whether, and this is a question that's very much raised in the market, the capital requirements are actually appropriately calibrated to the risks of the 
um, exposures and whether that was a sort of analysis that was being undertaken, planned to be undertaken. And, you know, obviously this goes to the the the, the, the points that um, panellists and others are making around non-neutrality, but it seems as though that's potentially a kind of separate data exercise in terms of looking at that calibration relative to the actual performance and risks of the product. That was one point. Another one is conscious that your scope of review excludes the coming Basel 3.1 CRR 3.1 reforms, but a sort of burning issue in the market has been the impact of the output floor in those reforms on securitization risk weighting, which appears to be uh, very disproportionate relative to other asset classes because you have a, a, a sort of step up in um, a step up in capital requirements, both at the level of the underlying asset capital requirements and at the level of the risk rating formula. Um, and that is a sort of, you know, a bit of an existential issue for significant risk transfer securitizations in particular. So, you know, a question as to whether that was on the um, FSB's radar as well. Those were my uh, points. Thanks for your, uh, for your comments. And then we have uh, uh, two other uh, interventions. It's Ian uh, and Sean. Uh, Ian first. Oh, hi. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to actually, it's interesting that Joe brought up just now the issue of calibrations. Um, I think clearly it is true that the aim, of, one of the aims of the reforms was clearly to shift risk away from the, the banking system into the NBFI system. And so I'm going to address one of the points that was made before. It says, why would we try to reverse some of that by improving uh, the calibrations for banks purchasing securitization? And there are two answers to that, which I can think of. The first of one is the point that Joe made about the appropriateness of the calibrations and the point that Janet made about the quality of the underwriting. There is quite a lot of evidence in our view that the current calibrations for banks, particularly buying senior pieces, particularly buying STS or, 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 or safe, well-structured deals, that those calibrations are too high. Now, even if it is true that bringing those calibrations down would encourage more banks to be in that part of the market and that that's not a role that we or a systemic outcome that we want, at the same time, correct calibrations are by themselves a public good. If the calibrations are incorrect, and you have to take those calibrations, not just by reference to securitization, but to the whole capital markets, because there are other things that investors and bank investors can buy. If your calibrations are incorrect, it means that by definition, you're misallocating capital within the system. And if you're misallocating capital within the system, by definition almost, that is not a good thing for systemic stability. So I think the first answer is that we need to get these calibrations right, i.e. to reflect the actual risk, because properly calibrated capital requirements within the entire system are a public good. The other point that is made is that the aim, has never been to move the assets out of the banking system. The, the aim has always been to move the risk out of the banking system. And the risk in securitization, by and large, I mean, I, I'm, I'm making a generalization here, but, but the risk in securitization is in the mezzanine tranches and in the first loss tranches. The senior tranches, particularly in traditional asset classes, particularly in STS or STS-like format, are pretty much riskless. But because they're pretty much riskless, they're also very low yielding, high, li high liquidity instruments. Now, those are not attractive to the NBFI sector by and large, which has return thresholds. They are, however, attractive to entities that need to buy large amounts of very liquid, albeit low yielding, cash equivalent type instruments. And those natural buyers of low yielding cash equivalent instruments that are liquid are banks and insurance companies. And therefore, since you can't issue the mezzanine without issuing the senior, certainly in true sale, if you want the risk to move out of the banking system, 
you need to make it easier for the banks to buy the riskless bit or to keep the riskless bit in the case to Tanakh's point in an SRT transaction. So therefore, there is no contradiction or tension between making it easier for banks to retain or buy the senior tranche and having the risk move out of the, of the system. In fact, those two are necessary to go together. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And uh, uh, last uh, is uh, Sean, and that closes the list. Thanks. I, I um, thanks, Benjamin. I just put uh, my comment actually in the chat. It was just um, to clarify perhaps one of the the previous comments in relation to retained issuance. Um, uh, yeah, as part of our response to to um, the consultation, we we make the same point in relation to sold versus retained. Um, just to be clear, obviously retained is not the same as SRT. So whilst clearly it would be very helpful to have data on on SRT volumes. Um, when we're talking about retained, we're talking about retained on traditional securitization. So, um, you know, that obviously um, cross references uh, Veronique's points and Alex's previous points. Thank you. And uh, 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 as we uh, are running out of time in this session, uh, I'm, uh, I will close the session now. And uh, we turn to the, uh, first of all, I Thanks to the to the pan panelists, uh, uh, and uh, they are invited to uh, to join the, the discussion in the second uh, session, which is on um, on the uh, effects of the reforms on the CLO market. Uh, we also have an excellent range of uh, speakers here. Um, first, uh, I would like to ask Kevin Ingram uh, to speak. Uh, Kevin is a partner at Clifford, Chan Clifford Chance. Uh, and specializes in debt uh, securitization and structured debt transactions. He is on the board of directors of the securitization division of AFME and is a member of the market committee of prime collateralized securities. Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. Um, and uh, first of all, I will try and be brief given uh, time, um, but I do think it is important to recognize how uh, serious and useful piece of work the consultation report is adding to a richer and deeper understanding of the impact of regulation on securitization, uh, including CLOs. I'm sure all the previous panelists and all the panelists here will, will agree with that point. Um, the, the CLO market itself has generally been liquid and stable. It's performed well and has retained and grown into being a significant supporter of uh, lending markets, uh, particularly in uh, the US and also in uh, Europe and the, uh, and the UK. Uh, I have to say, however, it's not clear whether regulations had a, a positive or a negative effect on that. The, the CLO market seems to have its own momentum, which to some extent has been independent of some of the changes in regulation. Uh, and I think this can be seen with the impact, for example, of the, uh, the US case, uh, the LTSA case, in 2018, where open market CLOs no longer were subject to the 5% risk uh, retention requirements. Um, and I think this is one of the key things really around risk retention with uh, the CLOs, which is whether the regulation requiring risk retention in the CLO space risks over promoting the form of incentive alignment at the expense of substantive evaluation of what the actual alignment of interest between the investor side and the people putting the transactions together um, is. Um, and I think to some extent, when you get to talking around risk retention structures, use of risk retention vehicles and so on, um, one of the questions that springs to mind is whether, in fact, investors are particularly concerned around that form of retention, given that they have other ways of evaluating uh, alignment of interest and so on. Again, the US experience of open market CLOs seems to be an indicator of that, in that that's probably the largest sector of the market in the largest, most deepest um, jurisdiction. And investors clearly, as the report indicates, find ways to get comfortable um, with, uh, with the risk retention uh, and so on. I think that brings you into um, the uh, the final point that I want to raise uh, at this point to keep things moving on, um, which is whether or not the the sort of the framework of uh, regulation around CLOs actually is the most appropriate 
for the uh, for the asset. Uh, and I say that because um, Cello is a form of investment product. Essentially, they're a way of uh, investing in uh, loans. Um, there are other ways in which investors can invest in loans. There's a very liquid secondary market for loan trading. There are fund structures and so on. Um, CLOs are the most heavily regulated of all of those things um, and query whether uh, looking at the assets and the features of assets and the features that uh, investors should be concerned about in a holistic way rather than trying to put everything into particular silos would in fact be a better way of um, addressing uh, addressing things. Uh, I will limit my remarks to that uh, to allow uh, others to uh, to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And uh, uh, also, thanks for being short and crisp uh, uh, in the interest of, of time. Uh, uh, I would like now, uh, would like to, to invite Steve Baker uh, and to speak. Um, Steve is a seasoned structured credit um, uh, banking professional and has been in the business for more than uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, he is presently a member of uh, J.P. Morgan's primary, primary CLO business, uh, focused on European um, CLO orig origination. Uh, Steve, over to you. Steve, you seem to be unmuted now. Maybe we, we move to the next one uh, and trying to sort out um, uh, the technical issues. Um, uh, next one in, in line would be uh, Edwin uh, Wilches. Um, Edwin is a managing director and co-head of PGIM uh, fixed income secur securitized product team. Um, Edwin is also a portfolio manager for dedicated CLO tranches, tranche portfolios as well as uh, other dedicated securitized uh, product funds. Uh, Edwin, um, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, thank you for for um, for inviting me to speak today. It's uh, it's really a privilege, and, and look forward to uh, the discussion. Uh, we also believe transparency is uh, is very important for a functioning market. So uh, I do strongly commend you guys for having this uh, public forum. At a very macro level. Uh, we do believe some of regulatory firms have helped create a more stable global financial system today, uh, most notably uh, bank global bank regulations. Um, from a financing perspective, we have also observed a shift from the financing of certain assets, in particular leveraged corporate lending, away from bank balance sheets and into non-bank financial intermediaries, uh, most notably CLOs and private credit funds. Uh, we do believe securitization is a key funding source for the economy as it provides an important source of capital that generally matches the tenors of the underlying assets. Uh, however, we do see the use of securitization and the funding of the economy uh, vary greatly between uh, geographies. Uh, switching specifically to risk retention, uh, we have a fascinating case study playing out between the US and, the, and, and Europe uh, as both markets have implemented risk retention very differently. Um, as, as Kevin noted earlier, uh, per fact, per, excuse me, perhaps a few quick observations. Uh, we do not see a notable difference between the underlying quality of the leveraged corporate lending in the US and in Europe. Uh, we have seen an increase in, in leverage uh, in both markets. We've seen more aggressive financings uh, with much less uh, debt friendly covenants uh, across the markets. Uh, we also see the leveraged market continue to grow uh, in both um, in both jurisdictions uh, between bonds, loans, and private credit alike, uh, as we see uh, economic activity continue. Uh, so, so no true difference between the two regimes. Um, I think unlike RMBS, um, additional transparency has not been as meaningful to the CLO market um, uh, as well. As investors, we've always have ha have had access to the underlying. Uh, um, you know, assets. Uh, the CL market, uh, I suppose, does benefit from a greater level of transparency as the assets that are securitizing it um, are generally actively traded. Uh, so thus we have a higher quality of information going in. 
uh, and largely have, you know, uh, the corporate um, uh, issuances generally have, uh, you know, audited financial statements and, and we simply just have more data. Uh, moreover, as an institutional investor, I could tell you that our, our approach to investing um, in the US and in Europe is exactly the same. Um, our ability to access information is the same, despite the different regimes of risk retention. Uh, the key parts of our investment process uh, still include really assessing, uh, you know, what the issuers or the managers, uh, you know, the quality of their capabilities, um, you know, assessing the underlying collateral. And uh, and key in our analysis is also just uh, the documentation, which within the CLO market, uh, perhaps that's unique across other securitized markets. Uh, we see globally where investors, uh, in particular senior investors, um, have quite a bit of influence over the the debt covenants uh, in, in the market. Uh, from an investor segmentation perspective, um, you know we do see in the U.S. Uh, insurance companies are are much more active. Uh, they use Securitize as a way to diversify idiosyncratic corporate risk uh, in their portfolios. Uh, that, you know, investor base is fairly substantial in the market. Uh, this is a pretty stark contrast to both, uh, you know, the uh, Europe and, and UK insurers. Uh, to conclude, um, I do believe that the intended effectiveness of risk retention in the CLO markets has been mixed. Uh, however, other regulatory reforms have shifted risks away from banks. It's challenging to assess if risk retention has had a negative effect on the economy. However, we do see more financing providers, especially insurance companies, as I mentioned earlier, in the U.S., which could be an opportunity for Europe if further diversification away from banks or even central banks is desired, or simply just an increase in available capital. From a first principles perspective, we believe the quality of origination of the underlying assets is the key. Securitization is ultimately just a funding vehicle. In my view, positive RMBS performance uh, mentioned earlier, specifically in the US post GFC is due to the intense focus on how assets are originated and less so on risk retention itself. Uh, so I just caution on the difference between correlation and causation. And CLOs, as mentioned earlier, we do not see a meaningful difference in the origination practices of the underlying collateral uh, across, uh, despite different risk retention approaches. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Edwin, and uh, we uh, we have uh, Steve in the call. Uh, uh, thanks to a very resilient uh, communication system, uh, so he dialed in. And uh, uh, Steve, the floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, you know, thank you for um, inviting myself to 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 join. I think it's very important. As, as mentioned by the other panelists, the work um, that we're doing here. So I've been in the CELA market for over 25 years now, um, seen it going through multiple stresses, and this is to address the comment about resilience of the market. So the global financial crisis, the oil and gas crisis in 2015, you know, COVID, the UK LDI, Russia, Ukraine, inflation, and, and the asset classes continued to demonstrate um, the strength and resilience with excellent performance. So I think there was a recent article in the press as well, Global Capital, I think, basically stating what else do CLOs need to prove, you know, to demonstrate their resilience. Um, on risk retention, you know, CLO managers are really asset gatherers, so they're not originators in the same sense as a bank. Um, so, so CELA manager is more really like a mutual fund manager or a pension fund manager where they're purchasing assets on the, on the market, primary and secondary. Each one they are evaluating, doing credit work, et cetera. Um, and, and, and that credit work and the performance is really what investors are focused on. So I think Kevin made the point that you know for risk retention, uh, the, the the rules don't really fit very well with CLOs, and we actually end up spending a lot of time on the the form over the substance, which I think distracts from what's really important, which is evaluating the credit performance um, of the managers. Um, on the question of you know how banks change their behaviors, it has been touched on before. Obviously, a lot more focus on the senior AAA tranches. Um, it's interesting to note, I think that. Um, you know, say risk weights on government bonds being very low uh, since the financial crisis, that's obviously encouraged a lot of banks to maybe hold a lot of fixed rate government bonds, which in a rising interest rate environment, I think created a lot of 
um, interest rate risk that maybe wasn't accounted for. So sometimes with these new frameworks to fix old risks, say around securitization risk weights, it can introduce introduce new new risks. So that's something you need to be mindful of. Um, I think on page 57 of the report, there's an excellent paragraph highlighting some of the, um, I think, improvements that could be made in the market. Um, for example, streamlining due diligence and reporting, allowing STS to qualify, or CLO to qualify for STS, STC, um, certainly given their strong performance, I think that's warranted. Um, they should be able to count as, I think, more liquid assets than they currently do. And as we saw during LDI, there was billions sold in a very short period of time because um, they were the most liquid assets. Um, also worth noting, and I know it's not in the scope of this report, but like Solvency 2 in Europe, for example, really um, prevents a, a large part of the buyer base, so the EU insurance companies from participating, whereas in the U.S., U.S. insurance companies form a massive part of the buyer base. And I think there's a lot of benefits for the distribution of risk as well as benefits for the insurance companies to get, get those investment opportunities. And then finally, there is a uh, a comment in the opening remarks that you know there haven't been any negative consequences really from the from the uh, global securitization reform so far. I'm not I'm not sure I agree with that. I think if you just look at, for example, the difference between the U.S. and European markets, U.S. securitization market much much larger, much more efficient, much more able to provide financing to the U.S. economy, and the U.S. economy benefits from that. In, in Europe. Um, there are still hurdles and there are additional regulations as well, you know, risk retention being one that no longer applies in the US, but also things like in Europe, you need two ratings in every tranche. You know, I question whether that's really still needed. The US market doesn't require that and it's functioning very well. Um, and we could look at, say, for example, just the seal of markets themselves. In, in US, it's about four or five times the size of the European market, even though similar roughly similar sized economies. And the US is getting the benefit of that. And and I think in Europe um, in particular, and maybe some, some other countries as well, um, I think there's some improvements that could be made um, to help products like securitization and CLOs finance the real economy. Um, and with that, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And. Uh... And uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Victoria, uh, Victoria uh, Ivashina, uh, uh, to to join uh, uh, the panelists. Um, Victoria is a Lovett uh, Learn Professor of Finance and uh, head of the finance unit at Harvard Business School. She also serves as a research a research associate at the uh, NBR, uh, a research fellow. Um, at the Center for Economic Policy Research, the CPR, and a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of uh, Boston. Um, Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very important report, and I appreciate the opportunity to um, share my comments about it. Uh, given the brevity of the opening comments, let me just focus on what I think is my main and overreaching remark, and that's the fact that the reforms uh, in the securitization space were informed by the experience of the financial crisis. And uh, back then, the structure of the financial markets, and specifically markets that cater to commercial sector, uh, highly levered companies, as well as the mechanisms through which uh, securitization became a problem back in 2008, 2009, were important, but did not represent the full picture of what we are facing today. And so, first comment is uh, that the report does a fantastic job and is really comprehensive in addressing uh, effects, well, effects is a big word, but uh, addressing the goals, evaluating the goals of the initial reforms from the perspective of that initial uh, initial, uh, initial lesson that we learned back in 2008. However, one thing that changed since then is an element that was already raised by several people uh, in, 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 this, um, in this gathering, and that's the development of the private debt market. 
this, this is different for MBS, but for purposes of the uh, C loss and leverage loan market where C loss participate, uh, it is no longer the case as it was back in 2008 that the leverage loan market is the only space providing debt to these companies that are highly levered for one or another reasons. At this point, there is a significant private debt market and that private debt market started to directly compete with leverage loan market. And so as we evaluate these uh, measures today, uh, we have to take into consideration that be it skin in the game or be it uh, additional transparency measures or disclosure measures, it's unavoidably sets the balance between private debt space and the leverage loan market where securitization is the driving, the driving force. Which is not to say that one is better than the other. There are some folks who were ready to take uh, to make an opinion that uh, one is safer than the other. I think it just opened uh, the view to thinking about financial fragility in somewhat different way once we tilt it toward uh, private debt. The second comment is that the primary mechanism for why securitization and notice silos were not the primary uh, primary concern in securitization in 2008, but broadly speaking, securitization became a substantial concern and a central to actually understanding the financial crisis was through the exposure of the banks, direct exposure to the banks to the holding of tranches of the securitized vehicles. Now, that is a super important mechanism, and I do think that the reform reforms make substantial advances in understanding what uh, uh, thinking about the exposure of the banks and moderating the exposure of the banks and and uh, dealing with an underlying. However, uh, since then, if you take a broader picture about how do we think about financial stability, there are additional lessons. And so in the way you can think about this financial crisis provided us with insight about micro resilience, thinking about how to make uh, CLO, uh, CLO, so securitization more broadly, very strong from the micro perspective. But there were other lessons that were more on the macro perspective. And so let me give you a concrete example. In 2020, during the pandemic, uh, we've learned that actually securitization can become an important force for uh, economic deterioration through the fact that in a shock like the pandemic shock, significant uh, potential downgrades put the CLO structures in particular under pressure of violation of their own covenants. In other words, we are not talking about whether the AAA tranches of the CLOs will, will be defaulting in masses. That was out of the question. However, if the CLO structures, which are sitting on its own contract and its own covenants, get to the point where those covenants can be violated, then that sets an, uh, a set of reactions of how CLOs behave, which is consequential to the economy and unavoidably affects banking sector indirectly, either through economic forces or through the fact that a lot of the loans uh, are still sitting on the balance sheet of the banks. Uh, pieces of those loans are sitting on the banks. So those two points that I wanted to raise, and again, uh, the general, my general thought here is that the reforms were responding to something that happens back then, and that was an absolutely important lesson. But since then, a couple of things changed in the market structure more broadly, as well as lessons in financial stability. And, uh, and uh, my comment would be to add those to the report. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And um, uh, as in the previous session, um, uh, uh, before uh, opening up the discussion um, and, and starting a Q&A session, um, I, I invite the panelists to react to, to each other if there are points uh, you want to uh, react to. And for the, uh, for the audience, uh, uh, we are not sure if, uh, yeah, I see. Uh, if uh, if the chat function is working properly, uh, please raise your hand if you uh, if you want to uh, raise a question uh, or provide comments. Um, 
Victoria. Um, I had two comments. One relates yeah. to the fact that uh, an issue about the transparency of this relative transparency of the CLO market was raised, and I completely agree with that. So, securitization CLO market is different, and in particular, there is more information, it's traded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I also wanted to raise a, a negative point for the CLO. I think that the broader point it's it's not. It is different and it's different in some aspects. It, it ranks positively vis a vis as a securitization and others negatively. And the negative is the fact that the underlying here is substantially more complex than underlying in other markets. Uh, so, in asset based securitizations, the underlying is quite different. In the C laws, we are talking about loans that are not asset based for the most part, these are cash flow loans. They each one of them is backed by a contract that is over <laughs> nearly 200 pages, and these are very, very complex provisions. The other point that was raised is about this reliance on the comparison between US and Europe, and that being a case study and kind of our best shot at attributing the effects of the reforms. And uh, I would push back on that. I do think it's an it's useful setting, but at the same time, there are so many other things that are different between US and Europe that explain the rise of the uh, leverage loan market as well as of the private debt markets in the US as opposed to uh, in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And um, uh, any other reaction from uh, the panelists to the first round? The only thing I would I would add to Victoria's point is I think I think it's important to remember the, these are institutional markets. Um, I, I think um, you know in the previous panel someone mentioned I believe it was Janet that said um, you know sometimes it ends up getting consolidated to large asset managers and and that's probably fair. Uh, however, I think the analysis as Victoria uh, mentioned is is complex and requires a lot of um, you know sophistication in the sense that you know you have to analyze you know. A, Point in time, well over 300 individual underlying corporate securities. Um, I think you know large asset managers are generally going to be more um, equipped to to be able to, to 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 have that analysis. You know, just share our own experience. You know, we have a very large uh, corporate research team. We have close to 80 analysts. So uh, definitely agree that the uh, you know the the transparency is there for institutional investors. Um, and uh, you know, arguably, I think if you're Buying these securities on behalf of your clients, part of your fiduciary obligation should be that you can get your arms around the the the, the underlying assets. Um, so I think you know from that perspective, um, you know I agree with with Victoria. And I think you know the, the the rise of private credit and and just corporate credit in general. I think when we look at um, you know just just you know bond issuance overall. I mean you know post GFC. Obviously, we've seen an explosion of of sovereign debt, but you know when we look across corporate, uh, we see investment grade and and levered lending, um, you know, increase quite a bit, especially post COVID. Um, so I'm not sure if um, you know uh, how different it is. I think that the risks, the key, the key takeaway for me though, to some degree, is that a lot of the riskier um, lending has gone away. From from banks, um, I think we see this even even in you know subprime consumers or lower quality consumers. Banks generally aren't lending there. It's it's the NBFIs. Uh, we see that in other types of um, you know things like aircraft lending and 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 things like that that had sh were sitting in banks that completely shifted away. Um, so so it is, I think it is pretty fascinating in terms of how. Um, you know how all these things have, have have moved to different parts of the economy, perhaps with more stable funding sources versus uh, just deposits. Yeah, I was just going to sorry add one very quick thing to Victoria's uh, intervention, which I thought was really interesting, and it's the point that she flagged on large assets, which are themselves are complex, um, and I think that's an area of securitization regulation generally and risk retention in particular that sort of needs to be thought about a bit because. When you have large pools of simple heter homogeneous assets, um, risk retention to an extent is a proxy for the overall portfolio. When you have, you know, smaller numbers of heterogeneous assets which are complex, 
you would expect the investors either themselves or through representatives as they see it, asset managers and so on, to do more work on the individual assets. Um, and that's back to the point I was making at the top, which Steve also flagged, which is whether the securitization framework generally and risk retention in particular, that was dealing really with assets like residential mortgages, which we heard earlier, which are much more homogenous, fits well with asset classes where you have smaller numbers of heterogeneous assets. It's beyond the scope of the report and this thing to talk about commercial real estate, for example, but a small number of uh, large commercial real estate loans are a mile away from talking about a large homogenous portfolio of uh, residential loans. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, if there's uh, no one from the panelists uh, wanting to react, then I would um, uh, first hand over to uh, Costas with a question. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot to the panelists as well. Um, on my end, uh, very good comments. Uh, one quick uh, uh, comment and, and, and perhaps two questions to throw at them as well as at the general audience. Uh, obviously, the uh, focus of this evaluation is on the um, global reforms, and we know that there's a very active debate in the EU on the securitization, future of the securitization, the capital markets union. Some of the EU reforms uh, go beyond the uh, international, the global framework, um, um, perhaps uh, solvency two, due diligence requirements and the like. So while we acknowledge them in our report, we're not really uh, looking into their effects, um, just for the benefit of the audience. Um, one question I had, which was a point that was raised by, um, I, I think, uh, certainly Kevin, and, uh, and Edwin is about the applicability of the risk retention regulations to the CLO space and specifically to manage CLOs. So if we buy the argument that managed CLOs are just like other investors, then what does this mean about the uh, originate to distribute model? Are we saying that there's nothing to see here and there shouldn't be risk retention? Um, risk retention requirements on somebody because this is a, a basically market decision and originators are don't need that or are we saying that uh, there are uh, controls that take account of the concern about the originate to distribute type model in the CLO space and and whether are those controls enough I'm a little bit I'm aware that um, there have been many bumps in this market in the last few years but the market hasn't really been tested through a prolonged downturn. Um, governments came in early uh, after COVID, and and so the, and and the economies haven't faced a major recession uh, yet. So, I, I, so the, the, there is a question about whether the market has really been tested to be able to say that the the these reforms have been attitude or have been too much too ma too much. Uh, the second question is about this interesting issue of the emergence of private credit as an alternative to leverage loans and the securitization implications for the CLO market. Uh, I mean, we are aware that there have been discussions going on about securitization of private credit um, loans, including through the CLO uh, uh, segment. And I, I was curious about whether this was how this could evolve. What are the implications of that? Is that an avenue to explore? Would they, that bring more transparency to the private credit market? Uh, I would just be curious for the views of uh, the panelists. Thank you. Can I just take very briefly the first one and then I'll let the others hand over. Um, I think partly the answer on your first point goes to the point I was making just now in terms of the nature of the assets. With, that, with, that, with the risk of sounding slightly flippant, banks have originated to distribute loans forever right it's as, as an asset a large loan is made to distribute um CL, and, and that's why when you're talking to securitization trying to overlay something onto a well understood way of dealing with large assets and you're doing that differently depending on whether you're selling the loans to another bank in a secondary market trade or whether you're putting in a CLO or whether you're putting in a credit fund, you get fundamentally different answers, I think is not a good way of approaching um, assets which fundamentally have the same type of risks associated with them. So I, th I think the, the answer to me on 
um, not having any risk retention there is to say, but generally in the loan trading market, investors investing in loan products need to find a way to get themselves comfortable with the credit, which is the point that the other panelists have been made. They don't need risk retention to be some proxy for them getting comfortable with the credit. Yeah, so can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. This is Steve, yeah. Yeah, just to add on what Kevin was saying. So in a typical CLO, <clears throat> when when the bank is originating the loans and they're distributing to the market, you know, in Europe there's probably 60, 70 CLO managers and in, in the US more like 130 to 140. So, you know, over double that. Um, that each manager individually has to evaluate that loan. They have the credit analyst look in detail. They have a senior credit analyst also overlook it. They take it to a credit committee, um, usually with several members, senior members of, of the firm, to evaluate that credit to see if they want to purchase it for the CLO. And every manager does this, and CLO investors are quite focused on the process that managers have in place um, to do this credit analysis, um, the experience, the background, the track record as well um, to, to do this. So for a loan to be distributed, it's had to go through dozens just in, you know, just in the CLO alone, let alone there are obviously non-CLO um, funds, whatever, that can also buy the loans. So it's a very different model from you know, a, a bank just originating, say, mortgages, pooling them together and, and distributing. So it's, I think it's completely different. And then just to your comment about it hasn't been tested through a crisis. Well, the CLO market has been around for about 30 years now. So since the, the mid-1990s, obviously went through a very severe stress with a global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, um, performed very well. Um, you could look at the defaults history, uh, much, much better than similarly rated corporates, um, which is why the asset class, you know, came back and has, has thrived. So I didn't follow the comment that there hasn't been a test for the asset class because I think there's been a very severe stress um, that have passed very well. And since that stress, there's been, you know, we call it now, the market now 2.0, additional, you know, things, and, and this is you alluded to in the report, additional protections have been put in place. You know, the, the structures are more resilient to now. They don't include baskets for buying other CLOs or synthetics, et cetera. So the product is even stronger. So I, I disagree with the comment that we haven't been through severe stress. Maybe real, real quick, uh, if I may, this is Edwin again. Um, I, quick, some quick observations there. So, so I agree with, with, with what Kevin uh, mentioned around just the originate to distribute point. You know, the one interesting thing, um, you know, from our perspective is, you know, the, the size of the U.S. CLO market relative to the size of the European market, it, it's about five times as large. Um, when we look at, and, and Steve was just making this point, um, the number of managers, one would have expected that, you know, risk retention might curb the number of managers or might influence that, 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 um, that, that that number and you know for me it's really interesting that you know for a market that's five times the size you only have twice the number of managers so so to me that's 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 interesting the the other piece i think as an investor uh that we often focus on quite a bit actually maybe more so in europe uh and less so in the us is you know new conflicts of interest that arise in the securitization from managers owning risk retention generally if you're doing vertical um, you know, there's there's not as much of a conflict as you own uh, effectively the risk to all the assets. However, uh, due to you know the way that you know um, fundraising has occurred for risk retention uh, across uh, most managers, not all in Europe, uh, a lot of it is horizontal um, and it's sold on the basis of of you know double digit returns, which ultimately, from an investor perspective, actually creates a greater conflict for the manager. Uh, before they were simply just asset managers, as Kevin suggested, uh, as any other kind of you know retail fund or or, or other types of um, institutional uh, mandates. Uh, now there there's some incentive or some alignment uh, with with um, you know against the the debt holders there. Uh, not a 
you know, uh, not a huge concern, but just something else that arises, I think, an unintended consequence, if you will. Um, I think to to um, Costas's point, you know, look, I, I agree with both Steve and Costas in terms of the market has been and hasn't been tested. I would say from our perspective, when we look back, you know, the 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 steel 1.0 and 2.0 really started in the 2000s. I know there were some deals in the 90s. Um, you know, we don't think the market has been tested from the perspective of true corporate stress. Um, so we have not had a corporate recession um, in, you know, well over two decades. Uh, so from that perspective, I do think, you know, there, there is some, some degree of untestedness. We've, we've survived liquidity crisis quite well, just because, um, you know, to your earlier points, regular, uh, central banks have come uh, to the aid of the markets and have curbed uh, meaningful corporate losses. Uh, so we haven't seen corporate losses get to a point where it, it would hurt the CLO market. However, um, I do think, you know, back to, you know, the origination is key and, and securitization is simply a financing vehicle. You know, when there is a corporate stress, you know, by our numbers, at least U.S. CLOs own about two thirds of the collapse of all outstanding bank loans and European CLOs own close to 75 percent. So I think we'd, we'd see a lot of dispersion between managers and deals. Um, to Steve's point earlier, every manager has a process and, and, and portfolios don't all look the same. Uh, but, you know, if, if there is some degree of losses in the corporate market, uh, I think inevitably uh, the CLO market will also see some stress. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, that that's unavoidable because again, back to first principles, it's, it's what the assets do ultimately, you know, the securitization will, will bear that performance. So, um, just, just want to highlight that. I think it's maybe more corporate stress, Steve, if, 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 if anything, we haven't really seen. If I can brief, very briefly add, uh, to Costa's comment. Uh, so 1st, I do completely agree with the other panelists on, um, on the fact that before. In, in the CLOs, before a loan is securitized, enters into CLO structure, it's actually syndicated. And syndicated market goes even longer than, than the securitization in this market. And, and it comes with its own incentive alignment mechanisms that have been working for many, many years. So that, that's the fundamental lesson. So what's going different here? But there's a point that uh, Costas raised, which concerns the role of securitization in the private debt market. And uh, of course, this is a much longer conversation, but very briefly, uh, it's primarily important for the BDC structures. And as of today, in the BDC structures, the leverage is at most two to one, which is uh, in itself an aligning mechanism already. So, in other words, uh, there are there is skin in the game for the substantial skin in the game for the originator of the loan, which is much bigger than than what we observe in the leverage loan market where banks are originators. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, uh, we have two uh, uh, two um, raised hands. Uh, first is uh, John Goldfinch. We okay. We hear you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for allowing me to comment on this. Um, I'm a partner in the CLO practice over at ANO Shearman. Um, and I just want to make two quick points, um, which are responsive to uh, a number of questions that have made, been raised by the panelists. The first is to note that um, we think it's really helpful that the report um, recognises that the interests of CLO managers, and in particular, those of arbitrage or open market CLO managers are already aligned with those of investors because of the manner in which uh, the management fees are both earned and also paid. Um, plus, of course, the reputational and performance considerations in what is a, a very competitive market. And I think that goes to the point that was being talked about earlier, which is whether or not risk retention actually needs to apply to the CLO market. But but in, on the assumption that we're in a situation where we accept that it does um, and will continue to apply, I just wanted to highlight that we have and will be submitting uh, a written response to the report. It's currently being considered by the Structured Finance Association, AFME, ESMA, IIF, and also AMA, although they're also doing their own independent response. And, and the focus of that response is to try and ensure that there is a full visibility and understanding of how in particular CLO managers 
um, that retain through what the report, report refers to as third party originators to, to fund and hold the retention piece, how, how they actually achieve that. That there does seem to be a, su a suggestion or, or perhaps it's just a perception in the report that this pr practice may not be fully aligned with the goals of risk retention. And, and the focus of that comment seems to be driven by the fact that the funding ultimately is coming from entities that may not, in all cases, form part of the manager's corporate group. And, and the purpose of the response is, is just to highlight how the entities that are being structured in that fashion are not what you might call uh, riskless intermediaries that should invite some kind of look through to the underlying investors, but they're actually structured as fully substantive credit investment businesses that finance themselves through a variety of sources of funding, it, it, exactly like any other business that wants to invest in the credit market or indeed any market would do so. Um, and they're to very deliberately designed to fit within the quite detailed rules, um, in particular as regards European risk retention. Um, so they should be considered as entirely legitimate when structured properly alongside um, managers who decide to nevertheless retain through their own balance sheets. Um, and it's, it's pleasing to note that there is recogn explicit recognition in the report around how the EU rules have adapted to ensure that this form of retention is acceptable, in particular with regards to the, the sole purpose test and the, the recent reforms. So um, please, please do expect that response to come within your, your time frame. Thank you, John. And uh, uh, for exactly that reason, we raised the question in the report to 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 get into a, an informed uh, conversation and and get your reaction and and views on that. So it's highly appreciated if you if you uh, provide a detailed um, a detailed uh, 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 answer to the consultation. Um, Last one on my list is, uh, and sorry if I uh, uh, mix things up here, it's Andrew Brian or Brian Andrew. I'm not 100% sure yeah. which comes first. Thank you Andrew. very much. Thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you for, to all the panelists for a really, uh, a really enlightening session today. Um, so that has been, that has been fantastic. I just wanted to address, uh, some of the points that Costas was making, uh, around the sort of appropriateness of risk retention for CLOs. Uh, and I think basically it comes down to two points. One is that, um, the difficulty of applying risk retention to CLOs will often arise out of the implementation of uh, the sort of international uh, international standards that have been set. So, for example, in the EU, uh, CLO managers are 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 stuck with the obligation to try and fit themselves into a category of originator, sponsor, original lender, uh, none of which really suits them. So uh, there's a substantial kind of mechanical difficulty there that is uh, nothing to do really with the overall policy of whether it's a good thing to, to have risk uh, retention applicable to CLO managers. Um, and so sort of worth separating out the technical from the policy point. Um, in terms of the policy point, uh, I think it's just worth uh, kind of expanding a little bit on a point that Kevin was making um, around the the kind of alternative methods of financing um, and how they shouldn't result in radically different uh, sort of regulatory outcomes. And the one that really comes to mind here uh, that I think is relevant internationally is that uh, from a regulatory point of view, you will often struggle to distinguish between for example, a debt fund manager and a CLO manager. Um, the categorization is 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 often extremely finely balanced and could be argued either way. Uh, but despite the fact that they are so closely um, aligned in terms of what it is that they're doing and how they're financing it, um, the regulatory outcomes are radically, radically different. 
which suggests to me that it might make more sense to uh, to develop the application in a way of securitization uh, rules to CLOs, uh, bearing in mind the kind of competing methods of finance uh, for those same underlying assets, uh, and trying to make sure that the opportunities for regulatory arbitrage there are minimized um, by by again bearing in mind that uh, that those two those two approaches for example and the, the one I'm thinking of here is is debt funds versus CLO managers um, are so so easily compared um, so you know relying a little bit more on incentive structures uh, to align interests in particular I think might be the the way to approach CLOs as distinct from sort of less actively managed uh, types of securitization thank you Andrew and uh, this closes um, uh, if there is no 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 one else in, on the list this closes uh, tomorrow, has, oh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow okay uh, just one minute on the comment made on silo retention and on um, uh, silo aiming to also to support economic growth I would just just to, to remind that in Europe the the SRT market is made for 80 percent of underlying set that are corporate SMEs and so on so and they are this market is uh, healthy since about 20 years and is supporting also the economic growth of course it is not a funded market it is only a capital market but we come back to the same issue uh, we if you want to level playing field you cannot have an approach is different for the CLO then from an SRT where the bank is retaining and is is obliged to have the 5% retention on his own balance sheet. So banks or not banks, again, the, the, there is not a good or a bad answer. It is the diversity which is good. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, the fascinating and insightful uh, discussion. Uh, we are running not just out of time, we are running over time. Uh, so uh, I will close now the, uh, the workshop. Um, thanks to the, uh, uh, many thanks to the, to the, to the panelists for uh, uh, their willingness to uh, kickstart the discussion here uh, and provide their uh, pr perspective. And also uh, thanks to, uh, to the attendees uh, joining the Q&A &Q &A session. Um, and the and the many remarks we uh, received, uh, we will reflect on today's discussion as we prepare the final um, uh, report. Um, I, I, I also reiterate that we are still uh, conducting analysis, so whatever can inform our analysis um, is helpful. Um, and therefore, I'm 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 uh, 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 urging you to send written feedback. So if, if there is anything you want to share with us, um, please um, uh, send us your, your feedback uh, to the consultation report. Um, uh, uh, the deadline is the 2nd of uh, September. Um, the report will be published at the end of the year um, uh, once we finalized uh, our analysis. With this, Thanks to everyone uh, uh, and uh, have a nice day, nice afternoon, uh, uh, good night. Thank you.